You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. We begin with a big orange caboose, if you will. The last space shuttle external fuel tank on the manifest made its way out of the barn at the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. The tank is affectionately known as ET-138, but you can call her E if you like. Tank builder Lockheed Martin pulled out all the stops for this one. Hundreds of workers were on hand while a brass band played. The tank will ride on its custom barge to the Kennedy Space Center where it will be mated with Endeavour. Now slated to fly the final shuttle mission, NET, no earlier than February 26, 2011. Now there's one more tank that will be shipped from Mishu. It will be used by Atlantis should Endeavour's crew get in a jam and need a lift home. And this is where I get to put in my plug for flying that tank with Atlantis one more time. Why not? And this is also where I get to nag you. If you have not seen a shuttle ride the fire to orbit, you are assigned to be at one of the last launches. No excuses. There will be a test later. Tanks for the memories, I guess. Prime shuttle contractor United Space Alliance announced its largest layoff to date, 15% of its workforce. Most of those employees are in Florida, since that is where most of their employees work. Somewhere between 800 to 1,000 wrench turners and pad rats will be getting pink slips. Another 400 or so will be sacked from other USA operations. More cuts are expected, of course, as the shuttle program winds down. And that would explain the turnout for this job fair at KSC. Somewhere between two and 3,000 shuttlers showed up to press the flesh and hand deliver some resumes. About 60 public and private sector employers showed up. Now, can you guess which company had the most popular booth? Why, that would be a certain California-based launch company called SpaceX. Better SpaceX than X-Space, I suppose. If any of those jobless USAers are space history buffs, and I know there are more than a few of you, you may want to consider this job. Official NASA historian. Apply at usajobs.gov by the 13th. Also in the comings and goings department, NASA's Wayne Hale is hanging up his headset, but we hope not his keyboard. The veteran flight director, shuttle program manager, and eloquent blogger says it's a personal decision. I sure hope he keeps sharing his pearls of wisdom with us. And the Hubble repairman just added another line to his long resume. John Grunsfeld is now a research professor at Johns Hopkins. He will keep his gig down the road as the number two man at the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is Hubble Science Central. Hey, if he can't multitask, who can? In spite of all this bad news, or I guess as a result of it, those wild-eyed entrepreneurs who want to make a buck doing the Buck Rogers thing are hard at work and making some progress. Check out a couple of cool test flights in recent weeks. This one comes from John Carmack's Armadillo Aerospace. Here, demonstrating his rocket can be shut down and restarted in flight, something solid rockets cannot do, of course. And at the Mojave Spaceport, Mastin Space Systems is also making progress on the on-off switch department. Let's take a ride on this recent test. Mastin calls the vehicle Zombie. Hmm, Mojave, the zombie has landed. I guess that's why they call this New Space. All's well that ends well up there on the International Space Station, but a Progress freighter docking was a real nail-biter last weekend. The Russian cargo ship launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on June 30th, carrying more than two tons of equipment, supplies, and food to the ISS. But 25 minutes before docking, Progress and the station stopped communicating with each other, and the Progress flew past the station. It wasn't a space spat, just some interference traced to a backup TV system used for manual docking. So, on the 4th of July, the Russians declared independence from the TV, pulled the plug, and the docking went off without a hitch automatically. Well, actually, it went off with a hitch, if you know what I mean. And check out this fireworks display, courtesy of NASA's new Solar Dynamics Observatory and the medium-sized star that we call Sun. 
It sent out these flares over a 40-hour period, June 11th and 12th. Here's another view captured in the immediate aftermath of a flare. Check out those magnetic loops. Solar flares are linked to solar storms and so-called coronal mass ejections. They are clouds of charged particles that erupt off the sun and wash out over the solar system. Now, when they hit Earth, they can disrupt telecommunications and power grids and really light up the auroras. Case in point, check out this picture shot May 29th from the International Space Station of the Southern Lights. This event was likely caused by a solar storm about five days earlier. Talk about a room with a view. This next item comes to us courtesy of our friends at the Coalition for Space Exploration. We all know about the Big Bang, a massive explosion 13 and a half billion years ago or so. It kicked off our universe. It may surprise you to hear that the afterglow, so to speak, of that event is still with us. Check out this much anticipated new picture from the European Space Agency's Planck Telescope showing the cosmic microwave background. Think of it as the dying embers, if you will, left over from the Big Bang. But look closely. In this image, the bright line across the center is actually our Milky Way galaxy. Planck Project scientist Jan Tauber steps us through the rest. Well, on this picture of the cosmic microwave background is basically the reddish stuff that you see behind the galaxy. Although the galaxy is beautiful, unfortunately, it hides part of the cosmic microwave background from us. And you can see that very clearly here. You can only see the cosmic microwave background in small parts of the sky. But those bumps that you see, those grains between yellow and orange and red, that is, in fact, the signal that comes to us from the Big Bang. Pretty cool. Suffice it to say, a comprehensive understanding of the Big Bang and how the universe evolved from there is one of the holy grails in all of science. We'll keep you posted on what cosmologists glean from this image and others like it. Probably won't be any big announcements next week. Calling all explorers, the Coalition for Space Exploration is hosting an online contest called Explore Our Space, where you can learn about exploration by visiting spacecoalition.com. By participating, you can enter to win tickets to view the STS-133 launch at the Kennedy Space Center or IMAX movie tickets. And you'll receive a free digital space-themed icon and wallpaper download. Visit SpaceCoalition.com for details and rules to enter. While you're at it, sign up for the CS Extra, the Coalition's daily collection of space news. That's at SpaceCoalition.com. Rosetta, meet Lutetia. Lutetia, Rosetta. The former is an asteroid, the latter a European Space Agency spacecraft. The two were like ships in the void this weekend. And the pictures are just phenomenal. They show Lutetia is heavily cratered. Now that's understandable for a four and a half billion year old rock. And check out this shot. That's Lutetia in the foreground in 60 meter resolution. And that object in the distance, that's Saturn. That shot is a ringer. And at ESA Mission Control, the crowd went wild. Well, as wild as they get there. <laughs> the Rosetta probe passed about 3,000 kilometers from the rock. That's just under 2,000 miles, for those of you who don't like doing the math. Lutetia orbits in the main asteroid belt and is the largest asteroid ever visited by a spacecraft. Rosetta's prime mission is to orbit and land on a comet in 2014. So this asteroid flyby was a little lanyap, as they say in Cajun country. You know, the more we look into space, the more we see asteroids out there in our cosmic neighborhood, looking for the big ones and making sure they have not painted a bullseye on, say, Cleveland is an important mission, or at least it should be. For years, the scientists who study near Earth objects had to fight for funding. But Washington may finally be listening. And that's good news if you happen to be the man in charge of looking for big rocks that could easily ruin our day. His name is Don Yeomans, and I Skyped him at Caltech's Jet Propulsion Lab. Welcome to This Week in Space, Don Yeomans. I've been reading about these dark, sinister-like asteroid rocks that the space probe WISE has been finding. Are we finding more near-Earth objects than we thought existed? Well, certainly WISE is finding more of the dark ones. It's designed to do just that. And typically the, the visual observations that we're used to find uh, preferentially the bright ones. So it's a nice uh, complementary system, WISE and the ground-based uh, optical systems. What's your guess, though? Are there a lot more out there than we think? 
Well, I think uh, compared to what we thought 10, 20 years ago, there's a lot more out there. For example, the 30 meter sized objects that could cause damage on the Earth's surface, uh, there's thought to be about 2 million of those. And uh, we haven't found but a, a small percentage of that population. So when you start getting into the numbers, that of course leads us to the odds. And when you hear 2 million, you think, oh God, it's a pinball machine out there. But fortunately, space is a big place. Give us a sense of the odds. Well, for example, a 30 meter sized object, uh, there's about 2 million of them. Uh, you would expect an impact of that size uh, every 200 years or so on average. So they're fairly frequent uh, and they do cause damage. The last one was in 1908 uh, in uh, what was then Soviet, uh, the Tunguska region of Siberia. And in that case, fortunately not a populated place. If that had hit, say, Paris, an entirely different story. So that leads us to this game of figuring out what the risk is. I've seen some statistical analysis that says it's like the dangers of flying on a commercial airplane. Now, when you have something like the thing that wiped out the dinosaurs, the KT impact, everybody dies. So the stats get a little crazy, don't they? Well, that's true. These are very low probability events, but they're very high consequence events. Uh, so, and there are a lot more of the small ones than there are of the large ones. So the KT event uh, that took out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, you wouldn't expect an object like that to hit, but every uh, million years or so, whereas these 30 meter size objects uh, that could take out a region um, and did in 1908, uh, you'd expect every couple of hundred years. What are we able to see right now? Is it safe to say if something the size of what took out the dinosaurs was headed our way, we'd see it? Oh, yeah, that was a very large uh, near-Earth object, about 10 kilometers or six miles in diameter. And in fact, we don't even know of any objects that are that size uh, any longer. Uh, and if there were an object that size, we would have discovered it long ago. What about smaller objects that might still cause a lot of havoc? Are there things we just can't see? For example, objects coming directly from the sun. Well, there is that. Uh, they can come from the direction of the sun, but more likely it's going to be a small object that won't even be observable until it's very close. And uh, in fact, that's how we discover them. They get close to the Earth. Uh, we observe them and predict whether, when they'll next return to the Earth. But of course, some of them uh, could sneak up and uh, strike us without too much warning. But these are the 30 meter sized objects and they would expect it to be uh, regional damage. And hopefully we would discover them a week or two in advance and evacuate uh, the, in the, the area that would be affected. Do you think enough is being done right now to survey the skies? Well, Congress has actually asked NASA to extend the search, which is currently focusing on the one kilometer sized objects and larger. Uh, they've asked NASA to extend the search to 140 meters and larger, and uh, NASA has signed up to that goal. So uh, we're doing this in stages. We're finding the most uh, damaging objects first, and none of them are a problem so far. And then we're going to the 140 meter sized objects, which can cause considerable regional damage. Uh, and then once that goal has been achieved, or we found the majority of that population will probably go to smaller objects still, which uh, would cause uh, much less damage. But uh, on the other hand, they're, they're much more frequent in terms of impacts. So the survey is an ongoing thing? Yeah, it's ongoing and should be ongoing for some time. There was a lot of buzz a few years ago about what to do if we found an asteroid that had painted a bullseye on us. I remember there was talk of detonating nuclear weapons far enough away so they wouldn't break apart, but to change the orbit. There was a solar sail idea I saw. What's the current thinking on what we should do if we found a killer asteroid headed our way? Well, if we found one early enough, uh, several years in advance of a predicted impact, uh, the most uh, mature technology would simply be to run into it with the spacecraft. We've already demonstrated that we can do that with the deep impact spacecraft back in July of 2005. So uh, if you run into it with the spacecraft, you can slow it down just a little bit, millimeter or two per second, so that in 10 or 20 years time when it was predicted to hit the Earth, it wouldn't. So uh, an impact with a spacecraft is really the uh, most technically uh, mature uh, technique. So even a few millimeters can make a difference? It can over the 10 and 20 years between when you strike the object and when it was predicted to hit the Earth, yes. So at this point, 
How do you feel about it all? Do you feel a little bit like chicken little, you know, the sky is falling and nobody's paying attention? Or do you think there's an appropriate level of interest and attention being paid to this subject at this point? Well, in the early 90s, there was very little attention being paid to these objects. But around 1998, uh, NASA got involved and started uh, funding full-time observatories to look at these objects. And the discovery rate increased dramatically as a result. So uh, we're finding a, a lot of these objects. Uh, and Congress has asked NASA to step it up and find uh, even more of the smaller objects. Uh, so I think uh, the appropriate level of response is, is forthcoming if the, if the budget proje projections for the new administration hold true. Ah, that's a whole other story. Don Yeomans, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Mark Twain once said a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting its shoes on. And so it goes this past week in the cable news universe. Now, I use the term news loosely, by the way. The kerfuffle I'm referring to began when NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden was recently in the Middle East and sat down for an interview with Al Jazeera. It's sort of the first anniversary of President Barack Obama's uh, visit to Cairo. Before I became the NASA Administrator, he charged me with three things. One was he wanted me to help re-inspire children to want to get into science and math. He wanted me to expand our international relationships. And third and perhaps foremost, he wanted me to find a way to reach out to the Muslim world. Now, I doubt that is what he really meant. But in today's media world, what people really mean doesn't really matter. And if you're Glenn Beck or Rush Limbaugh or some of those dim bulbs on the Fox and Friends couch, this was more proof Obama is some sort of antichrist traitor. The whole episode reached the media summit. I'm talking about the lead item of The Daily Show. In case you missed it, here's a sample. Since when is NASA in charge of improving Muslim relations? <laughs> is this indeed President Obama's idea of what NASA's for? The president has taken what was once one of the great American programs and turned it upside his head. The S in NASA stands for space. Why is NASA now in the business of diplomacy? Muslim That's American a space place! <laughs> oh, 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 it's a space place! We like to think of ourselves as a space place as well. But here the spin is all about orbital mechanics, not gotcha sound bites that are an embarrassment to what was once called journalism a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Well, that's all we wrote for this week. Thanks for being with us. Please tell your friends about us. Have them watch us on YouTube or iTunes. We sure would love some help from you. Check out our painless payment option at spaceflightnow.com slash twist. Email us, twist at spaceflightnow.com. Tweet us at This Week in Space. Check out the blog version, milesobrien.com. Thanks so much to our sponsors, Binary Space and the Coalition for Space Exploration. We really appreciate it. Next time, time flies. We'll celebrate the 35th anniversary of the Apollo-Soyuz test project. We'll talk to Tom Stafford and Alexei Leonov and ask them about the warm patch they helped create in the middle of the Cold War. And we'll tell you which movie inspired the real-life mission. That's on the next edition of This Week in Space. We'll see you then.